See Lion a cross-platform IDE for C and C++. Download now. Welcome to my talk today on using reflection to generate C++ Python bindings. Uh, I'm Calm Piper. Before we start, how many of you went to Alex's talk yesterday on C++ Heart? A few of you. That's good. That saves a bit of time. Um, but we'll still go through the Python bindings part of this. So this talk is about sort of using PyBind11 specifically for your Python bindings and how we can automate some of that code using reflection. So this approach will work equally well for things like Boost Python, which have a very similar interface from PyBind11, um, and, but not so well for things like Cython, um, which have a different approach for how Python bindings work. And we'll be looking at the, the example I've got have all been compiled with uh, the P2996 reflection um, fork of Clang. So that's the one that Dan Katz and I have been working on to actually give a prototype implementation of reflection. I includes things like parameter reflection attributes and we'll talk about some of that later. But this whole talk is based on a different paper um, that was written by a guy called Adam Lack and Jaguar Dave um, on sort of how reflection can be um, implemented using Python bindings. So, PyBind11. Um, binds classes, functions, enums, types, etc. so they can be made available in Python. That's the whole point of C++ bindings. Um, so that you know you can make them available and it's powerful it's useful but you do end up with even with something simple like pi mode 11 um, a lot of boilerplate code if you imagine that you know you've got to bind every function in a class if it's got enums every enum um, that every type that you're putting in your API you can end up with a lot of binding code there even if you're just doing one line per class one line per function one line per type etc and, you know, when the API changes, you've got to modify all this. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it can be time consuming to keep this up to date. On the reflection side, um, just a quick intro for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, Meta is the new reflection library. I'm still in an experimental stage. Hopefully, sometime soon it won't be, um, and it'll be a real library. Um, the double carrot operator is the reflection operator. And what that does is it takes a something, and that can pre be pretty much anything, a type, a class, a function, a parameter, a template parameter, and it reflects it to give you what it, uh, a stood meta info. We will call it a reflection for now. We won't go into any details about what that actually is in, term, in terms of how the compiler sees it. But then you have the opposite way around, which is this weird square bracket colon operator, and that instantiates a something from this stood meta info reflection. So those are the two key operators. Uh, then all this has to be done at compile time. There's no runtime element to reflection. The reflection is all established by the compi uh, at compile time. So that by the time you get to runtime, you've got real functions, real classes, real types everywhere. So let's look at a simple example. So top right, you've got a C++ function with a namespace, namespace API, a function does something. And you can imagine you might have lots of them. You know, you'd have lots of functions, lots of stuff in that namespace potentially. Top left is what this looks like with uh, just normal PyBind11. Uh, don't worry too much about the module bit. That's a bit that PyBind11 gives you so that you can actually bind stuff into a Python module. But you add a submodule called API, which is the namespace, and you add a function and give it a function pointer of where to call. The, the bits in quotes, the hard-coded strings are the Python names for things. Um, so you've got the API is the Python name and a function is the Python name for um, the call to a function. And down the bottom, you've got uh, the reflect code with reflection, which actually does a bit more. It doesn't just bind one function. It would bind all the functions that were there in one go. Uh, 
So let's have a closer look at what's going on there. The, this talk is kind of, I want to show you as much the how as the why. Um, so you've got name by the namespace up the top there, which is what this line's also doing. So you have this identifier of function. Uh, you pass in the reflection of the API, and that is the namespace, so that is the actual namespace you're reflecting on there. Identifier of gives you the name or the um, information about the name of the um, API as a string view, and then dot data just gives you the task star, so you can pass it into submodule. So that line does exactly the same as the line with the hard-coded string, but without hard-coding the string. Then you have this template for loop, and this allows you to iterate at compile time over the return value from members of. There's a little bit of boilerplate I've hidden on this line, which we won't worry about now, but essentially members of gives you the list of members of the API namespace. Now, if we're doing that, not everything in the API namespace is going to be a function. So we have to make sure we are looking at a function before we try and bind a function. If, you, if it's something else in the namespace, we will ignore it. So the first check has to be, is this reflection a reflection of a function? Then it's pretty simple. You just take that reflection, you get the identifier of it, which gives you a string view. And you bind it as you would do with Python binding. Um, up top, and that line there does exactly the same thing in both cases. You have the function name as a char star, and you instantiate the reflection to give you the function, and you take the address of it to give you a function pointer. And it just works. And instead of having to write a line for every single function, you have a loop here that does it for every function in one go. But functions have parameters. So can you bind the parameter names? Yes, you can. It's not as easy as it should be, but you can do it. So you can see here the way you do it with um, PyBind11 is you add these pi args with the names. So if you've got function divide values, you actually care which order the parameters go in. You need to know which one's the numerator, which one's the denominator. So you want to pass that through to, some, to anyone who's calling it from Python. So you can do that. Um, it's a little bit involved. I'm not going to show you all the detail here on the slides I will publish afterwards. There is a couple of extra bits of information here on how you join, the, join this bit up and how you populate those uh, args templates. But it, it works. You can use the substitute method to instantiate this bind function with args, pass in the um, reflections of the pi args as those args parameters. and yeah, it, it works. It's just there's a few hoops to jump through there to make that all join up. So next thing, bound functions, class bindings. Very similar. So you can see top left again um, how you bind the class using PyBind11. You have this Py class type. You template it on the actual C++ type and give it a string name that's visible in Python and where you want to bind it, which is you want to bind it into the namespace. And then down the bottom, you have the version with reflection. The subtle difference here is you'll notice that you have this is complete type. Now, there isn't a is class function on um, reflection, probably because there isn't a C class definition in the standard or something akin to those things. So the way you work out this is a class is, is it, it's not anything else, but it's still a complete type. So it's not an enum, it's not a function, it's not anything else. Okay, so it's, it's a class. And then you instantiate the uh, reflected type in the template parameter. So you take the reflect type instantiate it as a template, and then you take the identifier of and name and you populate it. And though, again, those two lines do exactly the same thing. Once you've bound your class, 
if you want, you want to initiate, instantiate it in Python, which you may not, you know, if, the interesting thing about PyBand 11 is if you actually just want to pass your class or your type through Python and don't care what's in it, don't ever want to construct it, you don't actually ever need to bind a constructor. Just tell Python about the class and it's fine. However, most of the time you will want to instantiate it, which means that you need to bind a constructor or some constructors. In this case, there are three constructors to our class, a default one, one that takes an integer, one that takes a string. And the way this works with PyBind11 is you have this pyinit function and the template parameters match up to the parameters you need to install to pass the constructor. Fairly simple. So you've got those init functions. So how do we do this? Well, I've written this bind constructors function. And what you have is this get pyinit functions, which returns you reflected versions of each of those pyinit with template parameters, and you just and you bind them. So that's what this bit's doing. So taking it one step at a time, the first step is to actually add the bindings for those pyinit functions with template parameters. Then I'm not going to go through this one in detail because I don't really have the time, but you can this is how you start to create those bindings. You essentially go through the public constructors of the class, you extract the parameters of the constructor, you get the types of them, and then you can use this substitute method um, to be able to uh, create those uh, pilot functions. Member function binding, very similar to function binding, except instead of binding the function to the namespace, you bind the function to the class. And here you just uh, go through the members of the class. Um, and so you the public member functions will give you a list of functions back and for each one. You take the function name and you bind it with the type. So there are, this, this isn't going to work for everyone. Um, where this is going to be useful, most useful, is for people who have larger APIs. It's, it's a nice approach. It saves you a lot of boilerplate code in the cases where you are doing very repetitive things. Um, you want simple bindings. You don't want anything complex. As touched on in the presentation yesterday, there are issues with Python bindings, particularly in terms of ownership of um, data, of objects. When you pa Are you passing objects back and forth between Python and C++? Who owns that? Um, and how you're passing that ownership. And PyBind11 has facilities in it to govern that, sort of control the lifetime of the objects you pass into Python. Make sure you don't delete a C++ object before you meant to. And you can, you can do all that. You can put it all on your interface. Reflection can do that. You've got this idea of annotations where you can start to annotate your C++ API. And you can look at that in Reflections and say, if it's got this particular annotation, um, interpret it this way. Or if it's got this annotation, don't put it in the API. But when you start to get to those sorts of points, Reflection probably isn't the answer you're looking for. You're probably looking at writing your, um, a specific PyBind11 wrapper or even something like Scythe that might be more appropriate there for going into the details of how the binding is meant to work. PyBind11 is meant to be a lightweight use case for simple bindings. And yeah, it's kind of, it, it works for that. And you know, if you've got, for instance, if you've got a big API, lots of enums and stuff, this is going to save you a ton of time and a ton of time in maintenance, you know, particularly when you're prototyping things. So, you know, this is all the code here works. I mean, everything I've given you is snippets, but um, I do have working code and it, it's nice. It's kind of, it's nice and it's going to save time in some cases. The um, last thing I want to say is thank you to Aaron Lack and Jagrat Dave for the work on the uh, paper for using reflection for, py for Python binding and that can Dan Katz and everyone else who's wor actually worked on the Clang compiler um, to make this possible. Um, so yeah, thank you to them. Any questions?